So just to reiterate on our discussion, so to minimize formal charges for n equals three or greater elements, double and triple bonds can be formed that would lead to an expanded octet. So for example, for sulfuric acid, if you are in, for example, chem 100, where expanded octets are not brought up substantially, you would draw the following structure for sulfuric acid. As you notice, this, the formal charges are quite large. And to minimize formal charges, we invoke a structure or we draw a structure that utilizes an expanded octet. This only works because sulfur is n equals three it is far down in the periodic table. This would not work for atoms higher up in the periodic table. Now to revisit, let's look at SO2. Let's look at sulfur dioxide one more time. So counting electrons, we have six electrons from sulfur and from oxygen, we have six electrons and we have two oxygen atoms. So in total, we have 18 electrons to work with. So what is our central atom going to be? What is our central atom going to be? Sulfur, yep. Okay, so we're gonna surround it with two oxygen atoms and form one bond each. So we have 14 electrons remaining. Now, where do we place our lone pair electrons first, on sulfur or on oxygen? Oxygen, yep. So we place our six lone pair electrons on each oxygen atom. So we have two electrons remaining. The last two electrons go on sulfur. Now, my question to all of you is, does sulfur have a complete octet? Does sulfur have a complete octet? No. So let's take one of our lone pairs and form a double bond. Now, looking at this structure, looking at this structure, my question to you is, does this structure follow the octet rule? Yes, okay. But looking at our formal charges, this sulfur has a formal charge of six minus three minus two, or a formal charge of plus one, while this oxygen has a formal charge of minus one. So to minimize formal charges, can we draw an expanded octet structure? Can we form another bond? Yeah, we can. So let's take this lone pair, push it down, and let's form an expanded octet structure. Sorry about that. So this is sulfur dioxide drawn correctly. All of our atoms have zero formal charges. Now my question to all of you is, just to make sure you really understand what's going on here, can I draw the same structure? Can I take ozone and draw the, an expanded octet structure? Is this okay? Is this okay to do for ozone? Can I draw this structure for ozone? Does this work? Yes or no? Remembering our rule that we're looking at n equals three and below, and if we know oxygen is n equals two, can oxygen accommodate an expanded octet? Can you draw this expanded octet structure for oxygen? Let's get some responses in the chat. What, what does everyone think? If expanded octets apply to large atoms that are in, in the third row and below, oxygen is in the second row, can oxygen exhibit an expanded octet? Let's get some responses in the chat. This is really important. 
can oxygen exhibit an expanded octet? I'd like to see about three to four responses in the chat just to make sure we're comfortable with this. No, oxygen cannot. Do not draw an expanded octet structure for oxygen. That's exactly right. You're stuck with this structure for oxygen because oxygen cannot accommodate an expanded octet. It's only in the second row. It doesn't have the empty D orbitals that can form these additional bonds. So sulfur can accommodate an expanded octet, oxygen cannot. Does that make sense to everyone? Is everyone comfortable with this idea? Expanded octets only apply to elements that are in the third row and below in the periodic table. Okay, uh, let's look at a few more examples. So let's look at the following cation. So ClO2 plus. So chlorine contributes seven electrons. Oxygen contributes six electrons and we have two of them. We have seven plus 12 minus one. That in turn gives us 18. What is our central atom going to be in this case? What is the least electronegative atom? Somewhat ironically in this case, what is the least electronegative atom? Chlorine. So we're gonna put chlorine in the center, surround it with our two oxygen atoms, and we're gonna form one bond each. We now have 14 electrons remaining, and my question to you is, where do we place our lone pair electrons first? Oxygen. So we have two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So we have two electrons remaining. The last two electrons go on chlorine. Now, does chlorine have a complete octet? Does chlorine have a complete octet? No. So we're going to take one of our lone pairs and we're going to use it to form a double bond. Now, if we look at our formal charges, the formal charge of oxygen is minus one. What is the formal charge of chlorine? Just take, take like a minute and calculate the formal charge of chlorine. What is the formal charge of chlorine as drawn? Let's see, we have seven minus three minus two. Yep, plus two. Chlorine for sure doesn't want a plus two formal charge. So what we're going to do is we're gonna kick a lone pair down and generate an expanded octet structure. So we have the following expanded octet structure, which is giving me reminders of ozone or sulfur dioxide. The chlorine still has a positive formal charge, but we've minimized our formal charges substantially. Does that make sense to everyone? You can invoke an expanded octet to minimize formal charges if your central atom is n equals three and below. Okay, let's look at, what do we call ClO2? What do we call that? What was the name for that? The common polyatomic ion. What is ClO2 minus? What do we call that? Chloride, exactly right. Wonderful, so this is chloride. So I can even ask you to draw Lewis structures of common named compounds. Okay, wonderful. So counting electrons, we have seven electrons for chlorine. Oxygen is six electrons. We have two oxygens. So we have seven plus 12. What do we do with this negative one charge? Do we add or subtract from our total? Do we add or subtract from our total? Add, so plus one. That in turn gives us 20 electrons. We place chlorine as our central atom, surround it with two oxygens, and we form one bond each. So we have 16 electrons remaining. Where do we place our lone pair electrons first? 
oxygen. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. We now have four electrons remaining. We place our last four electrons on chlorine. Now, looking at the formal charges, what is the formal charge of chlorine in this case? What is the formal charge of chlorine in this case? Plus one, we have seven minus two minus four, which is plus one. Both of these oxygens are minus one. So in order to mitigate and reduce our formal charges, we're gonna kick one of our electrons down, or one of our lone pairs down, and we're gonna generate the following resonance structure, which more readily reflects the actual distribution of electron density in our molecule. Again, another expanded octet structure. Okay, let's do one more. I'd like you to take a moment and spend about three to four minutes and draw out a reasonable Lewis structure for the bromate anion. So let's take about three to four minutes and then we'll discuss as a group. and we'll discuss in about three minutes. And don't be shy to message me. Your one way to help message your proposed Lewis structure in chat is you can message me the number of total bonds to the bromine atom in your final structure, and that'll allow me to check your work. If you want, you can also try utilizing the annotate tool to share your response on our class whiteboard that I'm currently writing on. Um, if not, we'll discuss in about a minute and a half. I want to give everyone the time to work through and really practice drawing out these structures as this is a skill you'll use again and again in 102 and especially in organic. Okay, so let's discuss now. 
So counting electrons, bromine is seven electrons, oxygen is six electrons, and we have three oxygen atoms. That gives us 18. So we have seven plus 18. We have a minus one charge, so we add one to our total, giving us 26 electrons. Now, what is our central atom going to be? What is our central atom going to be? Bromine, yep. Okay. We're next going to surround it with three oxygen atoms and form one bond each, using up six electrons. We now have 20 electrons remaining. Where do we place our lone pairs first? What, where do we place our lone pairs first? Oxygen. So we have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and the last two go on bromine. So we've blown through all of our electrons. Is this structure perfect? Is this structure good? Is this structure as good as we can make it? Well, let's look. Each of these oxygens have a formal charge of minus one. What about this bromine atom? What's the formal charge of this bromine atom? What's the formal charge of this bromine atom? It's plus two. That's not very good. So what we're going to do is we're going to kick down lone pairs to reduce the formal charge of bromine to zero. So we have a plus two formal charge, so we kick down two lone pairs. That in turn gives us the following structure. And in this case, we've fulfilled the octet rule and we've minimized our formal charges. Does that make sense to everyone? So I'm gonna leave these next expanded octet examples for you to work on at home. There's one special case when we think about oxy acids, your hydrogen atoms are bonded to oxygen and make sure you only place one hydrogen atom on each oxygen. So looking at HClO, which is, which is hypochlorous acid, our central atom is chlorine. Okay. Now, attached to chlorine, we put an oxygen. Where do we put our hydrogen? Do we attach our hydrogen to oxygen or chlorine if we're following the rule for oxy acids? Do we put our hydrogen on oxygen or chlorine? Oxygen, okay. Now we'll do our electron count. We have seven electrons for chlorine. Hydrogen, we have one electron. Oxygen, we have six electrons. So we have 14 electrons total. We form one bond each. We're down to 10 electrons. Where do we place our lone pairs? Where do we place our lone pairs? Where do we place our lone pairs? Chlorine, sure, two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. Perfect, so we've used up all of our electrons and we now have a completely valid Lewis structure. Okay, let's look next at the following compound, HPO3. So not quite phosphite, something a little bit different. So counting electrons, phosphorus is five electrons, oxygen is six electrons, and we have three of them. Hydrogen is one electron. So we have five plus 18 plus one, that gives us 24. What will our central atom be? What will our central atom be? What's our central atom in this molecule? Phosphorus, yep. So we surround phosphorus with three oxygens, and then where do I put the hydrogen? Attached to phosphorus or oxygen, if this is an oxy acid. We attach it to oxygen. Then we form one bond each. So we've used up eight electrons. We have 16 electrons remaining. Now we distribute our lone pairs. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. So we've used up our electrons. 
Now, my question to all of you, is this structure as perfect as we can make it? Is this structure as good as we can make it? No. So if we look at our formal charges, again, I would really encourage you to practice calculating formal charges. The formal charges of each of our oxygens are minus one. And the formal charge of our phosphorus is five minus three, it's plus two. So how many additional bonds do we need to make with phosphorus? How many additional bonds do we need to make with phosphorus to get rid of that formal charge? How many additional bonds do we need to make? Just one? If we have a plus two formal charge, how many bonds do we need to make? Two, yep, exactly right. So let's kick down our lone pair. One, two, and that in turn generates, whoops. The following structure. So this is not phosphorus acid. This is an entirely different species. Does that make sense? Does this process make sense to everyone? Is everyone comfortable with expanded octets and oxy acids? Any questions so far? Okay, let's keep going. We'll leave these next examples for you to look at at, whoops, one moment. Sorry for the delay. It's taking a moment for our page to load. Okay, so what we're next gonna talk about is the concept of electronegativity and how it influences bond polarity. So here's our classic table of electronegativity. Fluorine is the king of electronegativity. So electronegativity describes how readily a nucleus attracts electron density in a chemical bond. Well, when electrons in a covalent bond are shared, the electrons are not evenly distributed. Now, if you compare electronegativity to oxidation potential, your most easily oxidized atoms are your least electronegative. So there's a relationship between electronegativity and the capacity of an atom or species to serve as a reducing agent, or in other words, to become oxidized. Okay, so we really care about electronegativity because we can describe the nature of a chemical bond by looking at the electronegativity of each of the atoms in our bond. So the difference in electronegativity between atoms in a bond determines whether the bond is ionic, polar covalent, or pure covalent. So if our difference in electronegativity is less than 0 0.4, this mainly applies to carbon-hydrogen bonds, or if you have two identical atoms bonded to each other, there is functionally an equal sharing of electrons. So for example, in chlorine, this electron pair is equally shared. So if we were to draw like an electron distribution map, it would be a nice even sharing of electrons. They both pull on the electrons with equal strength. So the nature of a bond is based on the difference in electronegativity. And in this case, our difference in electronegativity, we take about 3.0 minus 3.0, and our difference is zero. It doesn't matter that both of these chlorines are very electronegative. When they're pulling against each other, when they're both competing to see who can pull on the electron density most readily, they're equally electronegative, so that lone pair is equally shared. Does this idea make sense? Does this remind you a little bit of our discussion in chapter three? 
Okay, if our difference in electronegativity is greater than 0.4 and less than 0 0.2, we have a polar covalent bond, which involves an unequal sharing of electrons. So carbon and oxygen, so our difference in electronegativity, about 3.0 minus 2.1, that gives us a difference in electronegativity of 0 0.9. So if we compare carbon and oxygen and we think about the electron density shared between carbon and oxygen in a carbon-oxygen bond, if we were to draw a map, oxygen will have the majority of the electron density. So oxygen will build up a partial negative charge while carbon will build up a partial positive charge. So in other words, oxygen is more electronegative. And as a result, it has more of the electron density drawn towards our oxygen atom from our shared electron density in our bond. That is why oxygen ends up building a negative charge because oxygen has an excess of electron density while carbon builds a positive charge because it has a deficiency of electron density. Okay. Now, if you, if you push the difference in electronegativity so far, eventually it's no longer even a nature of sharing. For example, sodium and fluoride, the difference in electronegativity is about 4.0 minus 0 0.7. It's about 3.3. So at that point, fluorine just takes the shared electrons. and there is no shared bonding electrons. Instead, we have ions, ionization occurs. And instead of having a covalent bond, which is shared electrons between atoms, we have an ionic bond. Does this discussion of the electronegativity and bonding continuum make sense to everyone? Does everyone remember this discussion all the way from the start of the semester around chapter three? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how Oops, one moment, allow me to reset us to the correct page. So, let's now discuss this idea of bond dipoles. Atoms with different electronegativity values will share electrons unequally. If electron density is unevenly shared, there will be a higher concentration of charge around the more electronegative atom. So bond dipoles indicate with delta notation that a partial charge is generated. Our partial negative charge is assigned to the more electronegative atom. Now, the arrow for your bond dipole points towards the more electronegative atom and it points away from your least electronegative atom, which has a partial positive charge. So for example, if we look at HF, which is hydrofluoric acid, fluorine is more electronegative, so it will build a partial negative charge. Hydrogen is less electronegative, so it builds a partial positive charge. Again, if we are showing a map of electron density, 
fluorine would have a large amount of density, while hydrogen would have a very small amount of electron density. So in turn, we draw our bond dipole going from the partial positive least electronegative atom to the most electronegative atom. Now, by looking at bond dipoles and our molecular shape, we can in turn assess molecular polarity. So we can see the presence of a bond dipole based on the fact that if we take a sample of polar molecules and we apply an electric field, those molecules will align to the electric field. Any questions on this idea of bond polarity and drawing bond dipoles. So let's take a look at a few practice problems on this. So using delta notation, indicate the bond polarity. So if we look, if we look at a fluorine chlorine bond, which atom is more electronegative, fluorine or chlorine? Which atom is more electronegative? Fluorine, right? So we draw our delta minus on fluorine, delta plus on chlorine, and we draw our dipole pointing towards fluorine. Okay, let's look at a carbon-oxygen bond. Which atom is more electronegative? Which atom is more electronegative? Oxygen, yep. So we draw a delta minus on oxygen, a delta plus on carbon. So we draw our dipole arrow pointing towards oxygen. Okay, what about a carbon-nitrogen bond? What atom is more electronegative? Nitrogen, so we draw our delta minus and delta plus. We won't worry about the nitrogen chlorine example. That one's a little bit tricky. You're not gonna see that too often. If we look at a sulfur oxygen bond, which atom is more electronegative? Sulfur or oxygen? Which atom is higher up in the periodic table and farther to the right? Oxygen, so we get a delta minus, delta plus, we draw our dipole arrow pointing towards oxygen. Okay, let's look at a sulfur chlorine bond. Which element is more electronegative, sulfur or chlorine? Chlorine, yep. So we draw our delta minus, delta plus, we draw our dipole ar arrow towards chlorine. Finally, looking at a phosphorus oxygen bond, which element is more electronegative, phosphorus or oxygen? oxygen. So we draw our delta minus, delta plus, we draw our dipole arrow towards oxygen. Wonderful. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a portion of the chapter 13 note set. So I'd like you now to switch and pull up the chapter 13 note set from Canvas. I'll give everyone about one to two minutes and we're, what we're going to discuss next is the idea on how molecular shape impacts molecular polarity and the process behind predicting molecular shape. And this is the last topic group that we'll discuss today. If I can get some responses in the chat once you have the chapter 13 notes pulled up from our Canvas page, um, just let just please let me know. Just so I don't want to start until everyone has the note sets ready to go. Can I get some responses in the chat that everyone has pulled up the note sets? They're under Canvas modules. <laughs> 
Okay, perfect. So let's talk through Vesper theory and, and develop some tools to begin to think about how do molecules look in three-dimensional space. So in Vesper theory, bonds can fundamentally be thought of as shared electron pairs, right? And electrons in lone pairs and electron pairs in bonds are going to repel each other, right? So for example, if I have an oxygen with a lone pair, this lone pair has a negative charge and I have a bond, these electrons are, negative, are negatively charged as well. So like charges repel. Electrons repel electrons, right? So fundamentally, Vesper theory is based on this idea that electrons and bonds and lone pairs are arranged to minimize electron-electron repulsions. Thus, the geometry of a molecule depends, number one, on the number of atoms bonded to a central atom and the number of lone pairs bonded around a central atom. So again, just to highlight, electrons and bonds and lone pairs repel and the molecules adopt a geometry to minimize these electron repulsions. Okay, so one method of counting that we're gonna use is this idea of electron groups or charge spheres. A, either a single lone pair of electrons or a bonded atom constitutes a charge sphere. Not a bond, a bonded atom. So a bonded atom counts as one electron group, regardless of its, if it's a single, double, or triple bond. So it doesn't matter the number of bonds, just the number of bond atoms. The steric number is equal to the total number of electron groups on a central atom. The steric number is the number of bonded atoms plus the number of lone pairs. You're gonna use the steric number in the Vesper table to determine the electron pair geometry. So let's look at a few electron pair geometries and they're, they're not, they're not gonna be a lot of them. You will have to memorize. So what makes a molecule linear? So linear is equal to two charge spheres. So this is electron pair geometry, just looking at the total number of charged spheres. So we have two sources of electron density or charged spheres. The bond angle is 180 degrees. Well, think about it this way. If you have a circle with two points, so two dots, what is the farthest apart? What is the farthest apart I can place my two dots? What is the farthest apart I can place my two dots in a circle? Well, 360 over two gives us 180 degrees. So in this section, I want you to be familiar with the names of each of these electron pair geometries, the number of charge spheres that correspond to that geometry and the bond angle. Does that make sense to everyone? What I'm expecting of you in this chapter? So looking at some examples, beryllium chloride has one, two charge spheres because we have two bonded atoms. Carbon dioxide has one, two charge spheres because it has two bonded atoms. Does it matter that carbon dioxide have, has double bonds? Do we care that there are double bonds when, we, when we're counting charge spheres? Do we care about the number of bonds? No. Geometries are determined by the number of sigma bonds and electron pairs, not the total number of bonds. Double and triple bonds are counted as one charge sphere. Okay, let's keep going now. The next electron pair geometry is trigonal planar. So we have three charge spheres that gives us trigonal planar. The bond angle is 360 degrees over three, which is 120 degrees. A classic example of this is BF3. 
Another classic molecule with a linear geometry is nitrate, NO3 minus. So if we count our charge spheres for nitrate, what do we notice immediately? How many charge spheres do we have around nitrate? How many charge spheres? How many total bonded atoms do we count? Three. One, two, three. Perfect. So it adopts a trigonal planar geometry. These are flat as a board. Uh, let me show you a model kit what a trigonal planar geometry looks like in 3D space. So a trigonal planar geometry looks something like this. It's completely flat. Does everyone see the clear 120 degree bond angle? Does everyone see the 120 degree bond angle? Okay. So another very interesting geometry is the tetrahedral geometry. So when we ask what makes a molecule tetrahedral, a tetrahedral electron pair geometry is four charge spheres. So with four charge spheres, it becomes optimal to arrange atoms and electron pairs in 3D space. For tetrahedral atoms, we have 109.5 degree bond angle. So a classic example of a tetrahedral geometry is methane. Which has its four atoms arranged in three dimensional space with a bond angle of 109.5 degrees separating our atoms. If, if you've ever seen a, a of a D4 dice. It's as if we have an atom at each of the points along a D4 dice. So here's an example of what a tetrahedral geometry would look like. Give me one moment just to put the model together. Here we go. So here's what a tetrahedral geometry looks like in 3D space. Does everyone see the clear, it almost looks like a tripod where we have this triangular base and then a top. Does everyone see the clear bond angle between our atoms? Okay. So I really want you to think of the molecules that we draw as not just flat objects, but objects with some three-dimensional space. We won't worry about the expanded octet geometries. Those will be refreshed in 102. Now, one important idea to note is not all molecules with the same electron pair geometry have the exact same bond angle. So deviations from ideal bond angles are very common. So this can occur when atoms have different space requirements. Large atoms distort bond angles and require more space. So thinking about this, oxygen is larger than hydrogen. So as a result, it pushes our hydrogen atoms away. Oxygen takes up more space, its electron density has a greater amount of electron density farther from the nucleus, and that electron density pushes our bonds away. Now, critically, electron pairs take up more space due to repulsive interactions between the lone pair and the electrons. Lone pairs will repel bonding electrons. So to showcase to showcase this idea, for example, if we're looking at ammonia, this lone pair is a space hog. It takes up a lot of space. And as a result, these bonding electrons get 
pushed away. This lone pair repels bonding electrons, leading to a smaller bond angle. And it's about a change of 1.5 degrees per lone pair. So lone pairs take up space and they repel bonding electrons. Okay, so let's take a look and let's really practice identifying the electron pair geometry for each of these structures. So electron pair is the rough shape of your molecule, not accounting for repulsions just yet. So let's look at pH three. I'll draw the, the structure and I just want everyone in the chat to tell me what is the electron pair geometry? What is the electron pair geometry for this molecule? Looking at our central atom, what is the electron pair geometry? So let's count our charged spheres. Would someone like to tell me in the chat how many total charged spheres do we have? How many total lone pairs and bonded atoms do we have? How many total lone pairs and bonded atoms? Both of them together. So I have one lone pair and three bonded atoms. So one plus three gives us four charge spheres. And if we have four charge spheres, what geometry do we have? What geometry do we have? Four charge spheres, what geometry does that correlate to? Talked about it just a, just a few minutes ago. It's tetrahedral. And because it's tetrahedral, we would expect a rough bond angle of about 109.5 degrees. Okay, let's keep going now. Let's look at hydrogen selenide, which looks a little bit like this. How many charged spheres do we have for hydrogen selenide? How many charge spheres? How many total bonds and lone pairs? Let's count one more time. We have one, two bonds, and two lone pairs. So we have four charge spheres. So again, we have a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. Let's look at a few more examples. Let's look at a few more examples. This time we're gonna add a twist to it. So electron pair and molecular geometry are slightly different. The electron pair geometry is the geometry of a molecule based on the number of charged spheres, where a charged sphere is a set of bonding electrons or an electron pair. Now, the molecular geometry, so when I say the word molecular geometry, it is the geometry accounting for lone pair and bonding electron repulsions. Molecular geometry depends on the electron pair geometry and the number of lone pairs on the central atom. Why is that? Remember when I said electron pairs take up more space? They take up more space, and as a result, and as a result, this is really important, lone pairs repel bonding electron pairs, leading to a smaller distorted bond angle. And this is about 1.5 degrees per lone pair. So in ammonia, this lone pair pushes all of the nitrogen, pushes your hydrogen atoms away from your lone pair because it's repelling our bonded electrons. And as a result, our bond angle is smaller than expected. Does that make sense to everyone? 
does this idea of electron repulsions make sense? Is everyone comfortable with this idea? Okay, so what we're now gonna look at, so is the trend in number of lone pairs and your bond angle. So lone pairs repel bonding electrons leading to smaller bond angles. It's about 1.5 to four, a four degree decrease. So for example, ammonia has one lone pair, so it's 107.5 degrees. Water has two lone pairs, so it's about 105.5 degrees. These are all approximate. As long as you're showing clearly that as we, as we increase the number of lone pairs, your bond angle decreases, um, that's what I'm looking for. So what we're next gonna do is we're gonna discuss the different subclasses of molecular geometry. So let's look at trigonal planar. So trigonal planar is a subclass of the tetrahedral electron pair geometry. So trigonal planar geometries have four charged spheres made up of three bonds and one lone pair. So we have three bonds plus one lone pair. Another way of putting this to make it easier is three bonding atoms. So a classic example of this is ammonia. How many bonding atoms does ammonia have? How many bonding atoms does ammonia have? Three, and how many lone pairs does it have? How many lone pairs does it have? Or how many lone, not, not lone pair electrons, just how many pairs of dots do we see? How many, how many lone, pair, lone pairs do we have? One lone pair, exactly right. Oops, sorry. So the trigonal pyramidal geometry has three bonding atoms and one lone pair, and it has a 107.5 degree bond angle. Another way of indicating three charged spheres, we often call species with three charged spheres, quote unquote, sp3 centers. So when we have four charged spheres, we call these sp3 centers. Another variant of the tetrahedral electron pair geometry is the bent molecular geometry. The bent molecular geometry has four charged spheres, or it's an quote unquote sp3 center, and we have a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. Bent molecules have two bonds and two lone pairs. So water is a classic example, H2O. How many bonds does water have? How many bonding atoms does water have? How many bonding atoms does water have? Two. How many lone pairs does water have? Two. Our bond angle is further reduced and we have about 105.5 degree bond angle. So these bond angles can vary depending on the textbook from 104.5 to about 105.5. Okay, so these are the, the two main variants for your tetrahedral geometry or for your sp3 centers. Let's look at the next variant. These are variants of the trigonal planar geometry. 
So remember, trigonal planar is three charge spheres. So what makes a molecule bent trigonal planar? We have three charge spheres. We call these quote unquote sp2 centers. And they consist of two bonds and one lone pair. A classic example of this is nitrite anion. And our bond angle is 116 degrees. Our bond angle is reduced by the presence of our lone pair. Does this make sense to everyone so far? The key thing to take away is I want you to memorize each of the electron pair and molecular geometries and in turn given and after drawing a structure I want you to be able to identify the electron pair and molecular geometry. Does that make sense to everyone? It's going to take a little bit of memorization and we'll start applying these examples in the following problems. So we'll skip over the expanded octet structures. Those will be refreshed in 102. And here's a nice little summary table for our electron and, and molecular geometry. So if we have two charge spheres, we call these sp centers. Three charge spheres we call sp2 and four charge spheres we call these sp3 centers. One moment, sorry, one note crashed. Okay. So, two charge spheres we call these sp centers. Three charge spheres are called sp2 centers and four charge spheres are called sp3. So in terms of assigning geometry, first you assign electron pair geometry by counting your charge spheres. Then in order to assign your molecular geometry, you count the number of lone pairs and depending on the number of lone pairs, your molecular geometry will change. You are responsible for the first six entries in this table. You should be familiar with the bond angles, electron pair geometries and molecular geometries, as well as each of these hybridization labels for each of these, um, for each of these electron pair and molecular geometries. Does that make sense what I'm expecting of you for the coming quizzes and exam? Okay, perfect. So let's talk and let's refresh a little bit about this idea of chemical bonding. As we discussed, bonding is a continuum Bonds are more polar and they have more ionic character. The greater the difference in electronegativity between atoms in a bond. Here's your table of electronegativity just for your reference. Remember, fluorine is the king of electronegativity. Now, molecular polarity is a really critical idea and it in molecular polarity quite simply is the net polarity of your molecule now molecular polarity is the sum of your bond polarity Mole molecular polarity is the sum of the bond polarity now there are two ways of dealing with calculating molecular polarity. For simple molecules, for example, hydrochloric acid, the molecule just has one bond. So the molecular polarity 
matches the bond polarity. Unfortunately, for complicated molecules, we have to use higher order or more slightly more involved reasoning. I really like the vector addition method. Um, quite simply, dipoles can be treated as vectors. So vectors as a quantity with magnitude and direction. So do you notice the, this, this arrow has a certain length and is pointing in a certain direction? Okay, so all of our dipoles can be drawn as arrows with magnitude and direction. You can add vectors by adding the x, y, and z components of each vector. So that's one way of doing it, but if you've taken physics, you know that the head to tail method is wonderful for adding vectors. So let's suppose we have two vectors. And let's look at a realistic example. Okay, so let's suppose we have a set of vectors. So I'll label these A, B, and C. Okay, so the way that you do vector addition, the way that you handle vector addition is first and foremost, you draw your first vector. So draw your first vector. Then you take your second vector and you take the tail and you draw the tail on the head. You then draw your second vector. From the, the head of the first. You repeat this process for your third vector. So you find your head and you draw your third vector. Okay, now that we have our third vector, this is where it's really cool. Finally, you draw a final vector from the starting tail to the ending head. The final vector, the final vector is your net dipole. So this molecule, our net dipole is pointing roughly down. Let me make let me make the red arrow the correct magnitude. So we draw our dipole from the tail of our first to the head of our second. So this green arrow represents our net dipole after addition. Does this look familiar if you've taken physics or do, does the the idea of, of dipole addition makes sense. You draw your vectors from tail to head, and then head, and then once you have your first vector drawn, you go from, you draw from the head, and you draw your second vector. You go from the head, you draw your third vector. Finally, you start from the tail of the first to the head of the last, and this gives you your net vector. This is a nice pictorial way of drawing and adding dipole. Now, key thing, the vectors are arranged along each of our bonds. So we need to understand our molecules shape in order to add our vectors correctly. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Does this idea of dipole addition make sense so far? Okay, now 
The beautiful thing is once we have this theory in place, I can teach you a trick that allows you to determine whether something is polar or nonpolar. So dipoles cancel only if the bonds are symmetrically arranged and they have the same electronegativity. Now, the molecular dipole is the sum of all the bond dipoles. So then, and I want you to just put a star next to this, symmetrical arrangements of polar bonds with the same electronegativity difference leads to nonpolar molecules. And we can prove this with vector addition. So if we look at carbon dioxide, both of our carbon oxygen bonds have the same polarity, right? So if we add our two vectors together, if we add our two vectors together, we see that if we try to draw a vector from tail to head, the net, there is no net dipole. Our two dipoles are going in opposite directions and they cancel. Ergo, carbon dioxide is nonpolar. It doesn't have a dipole. Does this make sense to everyone so far? The dipoles have the same electronic, same, the, the dipoles are the same because our bonded atoms have the same electronegativity. The dipoles are arranged symmetrically, so they're pulling with equal strength. And as a result, because they're the same magnitude in opposite direction, the dipoles cancel. Now, we can then develop a shortcut. And this is the shortcut that I use to quickly assign whether something is polar or nonpolar. So a molecule is nonpolar, not polar, if number one, all atoms bonded to the central atom are identical, or the difference in electronegativity between atoms bonded to the central atom and the central atom is less than 0 0.4. This really only comes up for carbon-hydrogen bonds. Okay, the second stipulation is the central atom has no lone pairs or has a symmetrical geometry. These include linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, and square planar. If none of these conditions are met, if any of these conditions aren't met, otherwise the molecule is polar, okay? So this is a nice rule of thumb that summarizes predicting whether something is polar or nonpolar. Symmetrical molecules with the same atom bonded to the central atom are nonpolar. Most molecules that you'll encounter will be polar. Okay, so let's look at an example. So looking at water, H2O. So we have an oxygen with two lone pairs and it's bonded to two hydrogen atoms. Let's do a full analysis of water. So first and foremost, what is its electron pair geometry? Let's look at its electron pair geometry and then the molecular geometry. So first, would someone like to tell me, what is its electron pair geometry? What is the electron pair geometry of water? And don't be shy to break out the electron pair geometry table. And don't be shy to volunteer in the chat. Would someone like to volunteer and provide the electron pair geometry for water? So I see that we have four charged spheres, that's correct. And these consist of two bonds plus two lone pairs. Okay, so our electron pair geometry is tetrahedral. What about the molecular geometry? Because we have two lone pairs, what do we call our molecular geometry now? What do we call our molecular geometry? And we have two bonds and two lone pairs, what do we call that molecular geometry? Bent, exactly. So then, if we look at our dipoles, if we look at our dipoles, both 
What's more electronegative, hydrogen or oxygen? What's more electronegative, hydrogen or oxygen? What's more electronegative? Oxygen. So our bond dipoles are going to point towards oxygen. Now, if we clear, if we look at our, our dipole arrows and we add them up, so we place them back to back, what, where is our net dipole pointing? Is, do we have a net dipole? If we add up our two dipoles, where is our net, net dipole pointing? Is it pointing in a direction? Do we have a net dipole for our molecule? So looking at these arrows, when we add them up, is it pointing in a net direction? Is it pointing in a net direction? Yes, it's pointing up. So our net dipole is pointing up. So we can conclude water is a polar molecule. It has a net dipole. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Okay, let's, let's try another example. So hydrofluoric acid, HF, it looks something like this. Is our hydrogen fluorine bond polar? What direction is my dipole gonna point? Towards hydrogen or fluorine? What direction is my dipole gonna point? Towards hydrogen or fluorine? Fluorine, yep. So this molecule is polar. Let's look at chloroform, which is CHCl3. So what is the electron pair geometry and what is the molecular geometry for this molecule? What is the 3D shape of this molecule? Let's start with the electron pair geometry. What is the rough shape of our molecule? Tetrahedral. What is the molecular geometry? If we have four bonds plus zero lone pairs, we're still tetrahedral. Okay, now looking at our dipoles, do we have polar bonds? Which bond is polar in this molecule? Or which bonds are polar in this molecule? Yeah, the carbon-chlorine bond, and they're going to point towards chlorine. So thinking about our rule, is our central atom bonded to the same atom? Is our central atom bonded to the same atom? Is our central atom bonded to all chlorines? Or are there different atoms bonded to the central atom? So is every single atom bonded to the central atom the same? Or are they different? They're different, right? Ergo, we can clearly see that there's a net dipole and CHCl3 is polar because the atoms bond to the central atom are different. Likewise, looking at the following halogenated compound, just at a glance, looking at this molecule, considering what do we know about the electron pair and molecular geometry? What, are the what is the electron pair and molecular geometry for this molecule? Yep, it's tetrahedral in both cases. Now my question to you is, are the atoms bonded to the central atom going to be the same or different? Are these atoms bonded to the central atom the same or different? They're different. So is this molecule going to be polar or nonpolar? 
is this molecule going to be polar or nonpolar? If the atoms bonded are different, it's going to be polar. Whoops, that's. Yep, so it's polar. Okay, let's look at another example. Let's look at ammonia. Whoops, one moment. Let's look at ammonia. So ammonia looks something like this. Now, what is the molecular geometry of ammonia? Let's not worry about the electron pair. Let's just focus. What is the molecular geometry of ammonia? So, so the electron pair is tetrahedral. That is correct. But since we have a lone pair, what do we call the molecular geometry when we have three bonds plus one lone pair? What do we call the molecular geometry in this case? Three bonds and one lone pair. It's called trigonal pyramidal. Okay, now we clearly see we have a lone pair. So if this molecule has polar bonds and it has a lone pair, if it has a lone pair, is the molecule going to be polar or nonpolar in most cases? Do our dipoles add up in one direction? So is this molecule going to be polar or nonpolar? Polar, yep. Yeah. Has a net dipole, and the lone pair facilitates this net dipole, makes the molecule asymmetrical. OK, so. There's a, a giant packet of practice problems remaining in this, in this uh, chapter note set. That is it in terms of content for the next exam coming up. So we'll stop here for today.